Welcome to Boost Busters Gas Exchange Handbook and now to course number 90 uh, concerning the single cylinder two stroke naturally aspirated engine. Uh, to be a little bit more efficient, I will focus on the most frequently used single cylinder two stroke spark ignited engine of today. Uh, and that would be uh, the type of engine using reed valves in the crankcase or in the cylinder and using the crankcase as a scavenge pump. The scavenging type would be loop or schnurle scavenging. Uh, so I will not talk so much about cross scavenging, uniflue scavenging, and not so much about piston and rotary valve engines today. The brilliant thing with two-stroke engine is its simplicity, few moving parts, and the potential to produce very, very high specific power outputs. Uh, this comes to a price, uh, because compared to the four-stroke engine, the two-stroke engine is a real multitasker. It does a lot of things simultaneously. Um, and Doing so, there are, of course, some drawbacks. One of them is that uh, the scavenging, which is unique for the two-stroke canyon and will be explained, um, uh, is not uh, able to keep all air and fuel inside the engine. So we will always have some level of leakage of either air or gas, and sometimes actually both. But um, taking on the humoristic side of life for us enthusiasts who enjoy the behavior of a two-stroke engine, maybe we could have some joy of the interesting noise and um, smell from the two-stroke engine, which comes as a part of the package. A simplified description <coughs> of how this type of engine is operated. Uh, please have a look on the pictures here. Uh, what is uh, different between the two-stroke engine and, and the four-stroke engine is that the crankcase of the two-stroke engine, at least this type of two-stroke engine, had a sealed crankcase. We cannot uh, keep oil in the crankcase since we use it as an scavenge pump. It's completely empty and it's sealed from the environment. Uh, we don't have any poppet valves on this type of two-stroke engines. We just have a flat cylinder head and the only purpose with the cylinder head is to keep the spark plug in place and of course keeping the cylinder uh, sealed off so the pressure stays inside the cylinder. Uh, Instead of having poppet valves, we have ports, which are basically holes in the cylinder walls. And when the piston is passing the holes in the cylinder wall, um, we open and close the ports. And this is called piston control ports. Um, piston control ports in the two-stroke engine consist of transfer ports or scavenge ports which are connected to uh, the crankcase. Uh, it's not seen in the picture here, but there are ducts which are um, uh, uh, mounted, mounted uh, to the transfer port, and they're taking air and fuel from, from the crankcase. The second category piston control port is the exhaust port. And the exhaust port opens a little bit earlier than the scavenging ports, that's why it's a little bit higher. On the crankcase and sometimes on the cylinder, we have kind of check well system called reed valves on two stroke engines. This is rapidly moving plastic or metallic uh, lips uh, with um, some level of spring force and spring constant. And they make sure that air and also fuel sometimes uh, can only run into the engine. So when we create an overpressure in the crankcase, the valves are closed. So they open just when we have lower pressure in the crankcase compressed, uh, compared to the atmosphere. Uh, with this system and the piston um, are going downwards like here, 
and we have an overpressure in the crankcase air is pressed up in the scavenging ports and the direction of the scavenging ports are very very important because the way this engine is um, exhaling pushing out like, exhaust gases is not like a four stroke engine with a piston we blow the exhaust gases out with the help of the fresh charge so therefore the basic idea with the loop scheduling system is to uh, direct air and fuel uh, to the upper part rear part of the cylinder and then by a loop push the exhaust gases out of the cylinder sometimes uh, this type of engine also utilizes a tuned exhaust pipe you can see that on this board picture and that pipe is also contributing and supporting uh, the scavenge pump uh, to help the gases to come into the combustion cha chamber and actually charge the engine for higher performance. There is a special course for thermodynamics and for you who want to move into more details and the PV diagram, you can go to that course. Uh, I just wanted briefly to show you that the PV diagram for a spark ignited two-stroke engine is a little bit different from a four-stroke engine, uh, not in the upper part in the combustion chamber, that's pretty much the same with the azocoric spark ign ignition combustion. What is different is happening in the crankcase. So we actually have two independent uh, PV diagrams in the same. And um, of course also the porting, intake port, scavenge port and exhaust port have some impact on how the PV diagram can be utilized. So the scavenge system in the two-stroke engine where fresh charges should push out old spent exhaust gases is of course a little bit of a challenge. And to describe it mathematically, uh, what have been done in the past is to create a diagram on the x-axis we have scavenging rates you by volume and on the vertical axle we could have two different topics it could be trapping efficiency te which explains how much of the air utilized in the scavenging which is kept in the cylinder in the cylinder and not lost by the exhaust gases A typical figure of trapping efficiency on going running engines is about 70 percent so 70 percent of uh, the delivered air and fuel is kept in the engine and approximately 30 percent is leaving the engine with exhaust gases uh, scavenging efficiency on the, on the other hand is a qualitative measurement uh, of how much internal edr old exhaust gases which are integrated in the scavenged there uh, planned for taking uh, place in the combustion. Uh, to describe this in a simple and understandable way, uh, the starting point is to create two extremes. The worst possible case in a scavenged two-stroke canyon would be if air and exhaust gases are mixed perfectly together. The best possible scenario would be if we have something called perfect displacement. Perfect displacement means that we have a short boundary condition, boundary, boundary between air and exhaust gases, no mixing at all. So the gases are more or less um, uh, acting like plug flow uh, to one another. Uh, true and um, realistic uh, scavenge system like the loop uniflow and there is also the cross scavenging which is not here have different opportunities uh, to place themselves between these extremes the uniflow system which is not taking place in this course utilize a poppet valve very similar to the four stroke canyon in the cylinder head and have a scavenge belt in the bottom uh, that system especially together with very long uh, strokes um, is the best known scavenge system and operates best 
but its engine speed limited because of the cam needed to operate the poppet valve. The loop system, which we focus on here, is a bit worse. So the loop scavenging system is a little bit closer to perfect mixing compared to, um, uh, to the unit flow system. And the same goes for the trapping efficiency. Depending a little bit uh, on how deeply niched you are into two stroke engines, you might already have followed my four stroke course. Um, I recommend you to do that because uh, I introduced something called time area per swept volume uh, to describe how much force or how, how much ability you have in your internal gas exchange system in a four stroke engine. And the same thinking will be adopted here on two stroke engines. So it's a good learning opportunity to have a little bit of a look how that was done for the four stroke engine. Uh, time area per swept volume is a way to compare uh, how a certain port, could be an exhaust port for instance, is suited to serve a certain engine with a certain swept volume intended to have a peak, peak um, engine, uh, um, engine speed and, and how, how good this port is able to uh, pass pass the gases needed to obtain a certain volumetric efficiency. Um, I have a focus here on the piston control ports that will be exhaust port and scavenge port. Um, the reed valve is sitting more or less on the crankcase and takes care of uh, itself in a very good way. I will take that in, in the end, but focus uh, this part of the presentation on the piston control parts. Um, the time available for a two-stroke Andean to perform the gas exchange is much shorter compared to a four-stroke Andean. Uh, so therefore, uh, the available time area per swept volume for a two-stroke Andean is a little bit more limited. Imagine you have a two-stroke cylinder, which of course is round from the beginning, but in order to make it easier to present on a paper, why don't cut the cylinder and imagine that you wrap it out like this and make it plain. That's at least what I have done here to show you how the ports look like in a modern two-stroke canyon. So the exhaust port, abbreviation EP, in this case is a free port uh, system, one major exhaust port and two by ports like this. Um, the scavenging port system is a five port system. And as you can see, scavenging port abbreviation SP, uh, the height of the port of the scavenging port is much lower than the exhaust port. And the reason for that is that, uh, that when the piston uncovers the exhaust port, we have a high pressure in the cylinder. We need to reduce that pressure in order to open the scavenge port and come in contact with the crankcase since the pressure in the crankcase could be some 50 kPa higher than atmosphere. And um, in order to come up into the cylinder, the pressure here needs to be uh, much lower. Because of um, tuning effects in the exhaust pipe, the height, or let me call it the duration, because the height of, of the piston is related to how long time it's open, is a little bit fixed. Um, what you can do if you are not satisfied with the height, you might still be interested in more duration or at least more area, is to widen the port. And that's why modern two-stroke exhaust ports uh, normally have more than one port. Uh, the free port system is pretty popular, but there are also two, two port uh, system available. Um, the scavenging ports are because of the boundary conditions for the exhaust port also limited. Um, if you ask the scavenging ports, they might very much enjoy to have higher height and longer duration, but because they are a consequence of the entire port system, the duration is limited. On the other hand, uh, you could have a lot of uh, scavenging ports 
with a lot of bridges to support the piston ring. So what they lack in duration and port height is to some extent compensated by the port, port width. Taking the first step to uh, convey to you how we uh, have a look on the time area per swept volume for a piston control two stroke engine. The first step would be to look on um, the piston traveling versus crank angle rotation. Um, the curve here, which is slightly like a sinus curve, uh, this is uh, the trajectory uh, how the piston travel is connected to the rotation of the crankshaft. So top dead center here, bottom dead center here. Imagine now where you have a hole in the cylinder wall called exhaust port with a certain height. Um, when you move from bottom dead center with the piston going up, you pass the uh, top limit for the exhaust port and you close it here. From here on, uh, the cylinder is sealed up to top dead center and here the exhaust port opens again. So the duration for the exhaust port would be this port, which is 50% uh, of the duration, and this part, which is the close, closing part of it. So here we obviously could create the relationship between port height and the duration of, of the exhaust port. The shape of the sinus curve is rather fixed. It's not like in a four-stroke engine the, where you could change the cam to something asymmetrical. This is more or less always symmet symmetrical. What you can do is to play around a little bit with the length the CC distance in the connecting rod and create some level of asymmetric uh, conditions um, between top dead center and bottom dead center, but it has a minor impact. In uh, this slide, we have taken a step further. Uh, first of all, I have cleaned up the crank rotation short a little bit. So instead of having a split vision, so two different halves, of the exhaust port, I center, centralized it in the picture. Uh, I also changed the, uh, piece, the port height dimension to port area dimension. And that is sim simply done by multiplying uh, the height of the port with the width of the port for, for different, different heights. Therefore, creating area versus crank angle degrees instead of port, port heights. So what we have now, uh, if we do it mathematically with an integral or if we just realize it, is that uh, the fictive area under the curve is angel area for the port. If we take into account what swept volume of gases this port is uh, supposed to, to pass or transfer, we divide the angle area with swept volume, and we have taken the first step towards time area per swept volume. Uh, so by dividing or implementing at least the planned engine speed for this engine, we convert angle area per swept volume to time area per swept volume. And now we have the key figure uh, or recommendation value for at what engine speed this port will be able to create the best gas exchange properties. <clears throat> I used the time area uh, for the exhaust port as an example, uh, but the time area for the scavenging port, for instance, could be obtained in the same way. Uh, if we have a piston control inlet port, it's uh, very similar but the piston controlled inlet port will be operated around top dead center is instead of the bottom dead center. But in all other respects, it's very similar. Uh, there is another time area called blowdown, uh, which is the part of the exhaust port, which uh, is open before the scavenging, the top part, uh, which is also of some level of interest. Um, so, and for the read valve, uh, the way of doing it is very different, a little bit more complicated because it depends a lot of 
uh, the stiffness and the mechanical behavior of the real valves, but it is also uh, possible to do that. So for a certain end, you could decide these four time areas per square volume. And thanks to Professor Blair, there is a library available um, which you can find in the sources for this course in his books, what kind of ideal uh, or recommended value you should target for all those four uh, time areas per swept volume. Um, it's easy to get uh, uh, <laughs> very energized by these key numbers. Keep in mind that they are just a recommendation. They are not based on any physics at all. Um, I like to, to regard them as a kind of incompressible steady state average uh, uh, velocity of the gases passing the gas, passing the port, uh, but definitely as a first estimate before entering tedious simulations or ending experiments. It's a very good method to get the first uh, proposal of the port sizes and durations. So moving from the internal gas exchange system to the external gas exchange system for the two-stroke engine. And since the two-stroke process is ending by closing the exhaust port, uh, the interaction between the exhaust side, exhaust pipe and the engine is much more important for the total result for, for the Andean uh, performance. The tuned exhaust pipe uh, is far, far more complicated than any four-stroke pipe, and it looks pretty much uh, as on this sketch uh, on the horizontal axle uh, versus distance. Hopefully you recognize the piston and the cylinder here. The vertical axle is a time axle basically, but it could be specialized for certain engine speeds uh, and then converted to a crank angle. And doing that conversion, we could see that um, the, um, uh, ba, 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 ba. here we go, the red beam here represents the exhaust port duration and the bluish is the scavenging uh, event. Um, the pressure waves are starting up when the piston uncovers the exhaust port, simplified here as uh, uh, point shape waves to make uh, my presentation a little bit simpler. But basically the outgoing compression wave propagates right through the tuned exhaust pipes. Uh, when it feels an area increase, uh, the compression wave is reflected back to the engine, which should ideally come back to the engine mm, around bottom dead center. Uh, the rest of the energy of the pressure wave propagates back, and some of it is reflected back as a compression wave and should hit the engine again somewhere between scavenging port closure and exhaust port closure to push ex uh, fresh charge air and fuel from the pipe and into the engine again, because the, the compression wave could very easily fill parts of the exhaust port with unburned fresh charge, which is a better use inside the cylinder, of course. Of course, some of the pressure wave is escaping after all the reflections to the atmosphere, creating fantastic uh, sound experiences. If we consider an exhaust port with a duration uh, uh, around 190 degrees or above, then we are also able to utilize secondary wave effects coming from earlier uh, exhaust periods, which could reinforce the outgoing um, pre pressure wave. And that will give even more benefits from the exhaust pipe. Uh, this is, as you might understand now, not a silencer. This is a tuned exhaust pipe intended for performance. And typically we will have um, a sharding effect of the engine to be compared with the turbo sharder, for instance, um, in the vicinity of a pressure ratio of 1.8, if we should compare. The pre pressure, rate, uh, pressure waves, they propagate in, uh, with a local speed of sound, and the propagation speed and the wave pattern is pretty independent of engine speed. While the time it takes to commence a 
duration of an exhaust port or scavenging port is very much energy and speed dependent. This means that the optimum return of the pressure waves could only exist in a very narrow engine speed range. In the past, uh, in uh, two-stroke boat racing, um, people were using telescopic exhaust pipes to reach through the pipe at lower engine speed and obtain lower, uh, higher torque or lower engine speed. Another option is to inject uh, a liquid, maybe water, in the beginning of the exhaust pipe, let it evaporate and uh, lower the temperature of the exhaust gases in the pipe. This way, the propagation speed for the waves could be lowered and the pipe could be retuned, as you could see in this torque versus engine speed diagram. So a significant improvement of the power at lower end engine speed can actually be obtained. Of course, the, the two-stroke engine also have an inlet primary pipe cycle but the value is not so big as it is on the four-stroke engine because uh, the two-stroke engine and the gas exchange closing the exhaust port, while the four-stroke engine uh, ends the gas exchange process closing the intake port. So the impact from the intake side on the four-stroke engine is far bigger. Uh, another explanation why the inlet um, primary pipe cycle is not so important on the uh, two-stroke engine is that we have a crankcase in the inlet system, a big volume which also takes away some of the else available pressure ratios of the decompression wave. I'd like to show you two simulated um, examples of um, uh, some interesting things which could happen in the two-stroke engine when some parameters are changed. The top view here is uh, changing the height of the exhaust port, uh, which is done by the YPVS system from Yamaha or the RAVE system from Rotax, uh, which could provide the engine with either the red curve, a low exhaust port for low uh, engine speed operation, and for peak performance, a higher exhaust port. Uh, this technology became available for uh, motorbikes uh, for the road in the beginning of the 1980s and was responsible for increasing the available power by some 15, 20, 20 percent. The ne next example is what happens when you change the secondary compression ratio in the two-stroke canyon. If we look on the lower slide, uh, the secondary compression ratio is the uh, compression ratio in the combustion chamber, the usual compression ratio. Since the exhaust temperature always drops when you increase uh, the compression ratio, uh, the tuning of the exhaust pipe will also be impacted. So maybe a little bit strange to understand, but higher, higher compression ratio will return a lower peak speed for maximum uh, uh, torque like, like that. Uh, of course, you could retune the exhaust pipe and optimize it for the new circumstances. A quick discussion regarding different scavenge systems uh, using the crankcase is uh, the, the most interesting uh, way of scavenging small two-stroke engines. Uh, the other would be an external scavenge pump by a high-pressure fan or a roots blower. Uh, and the latter is used on bigger two-stroke engines. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind um, is that the crankcase scavenge system is a little bit more efficient on engines with high engine speeds because they are able to provide a have higher scavenge pressure utilizing the short duration available for a port control uh, scavenge system. Uh, while the external scavenge system normally need a little bit higher uh, durations to perform their work. The starting point for this type of two stroke candles was, of course, the carburetor. A very simple device. You don't need any fuel pumps, no controllers at all. Uh, but have respect for this simple and genuine friend in two stroke technology. Because one of the f uh, nice things with the carburetor is that it has built in physics to uh, provide fuel to the two stroke engine also where we have uh, other retuning effects in the exhaust pipe 
which is not done automatically with the simplest level of, um, uh, of, of um, uh, fuel injection system where the load control might be done by either map-based system or throttle angle uh, position systems. The next level of injection system I would like to call the low pressure systems. They are based more or less of port injection technology from four stroke engines. They could be port or manifold port injection systems uh, where you in the throttle body have this uh, typical five bar uh, fuel in in injector sitting. Uh, of course, they have all the benefits from uh, uh, computer controlled fuel injection system, but when it comes to the real challenge for the two stroke engine uh, to keep more of the fuel inside the engine, they don't have so much to contribute with. Crankcase injection is the similar component, the low pressure fuel injection, but uh, the injector situated in the crankcase. To my understanding, not so big improvements compared to having it in the throttle body. Uh, scavenging port injection uh, is the same, uh, low pressure injectors, but this time um, it's existing in the scavenging ports. Uh, KTM have been using this, and to my understanding, there is some improvement uh, when it comes to keeping the fuel inside the engine. Uh, but, um, as further down in the system you come with your fuel injection, the more thermal loads comes to the injector and the preparation time becomes a little bit shorter. A semi-direct injection system is, uh, in my mind, a very clever solution. Uh, the injectors would be positioned in the cylinder at a similar height as the exhaust port, but uh, on the other side of the cylinder. They will have access to both the combustion chamber for at least a small period of time to do some level of direct injection. Uh, on the other part, they uh, could utilize a slot in the piston and do injection in the crankcase, which might be a situation preferred during full load operation. The uh, mostly refined system is called a direct injection system. Then the injector is situated in the cylinder head, which means that the injector can be fired anytime. There are no piston which is in, in the way. Um, and typically you would uh, enjoy to do the injection after the exhaust port is closed. But in real life, it takes time to not only get the fuel inside the engine, you need to have it prepared also with the air. Um, so, so, so the air molecules and the fuel really comes into contact with each other. Two uh, technologies have been utilized so far uh, that have been the orbital air assisted injection system where the air is supporting the mixture between air and fuel. Uh, but of course a little bit more complicated because you need to have a high pressure air pump included in the injection system. Parasitic losses cost them, yes. The other one would be a pure uh, injection system referred to as the FISHT system. Uh, the FISHT system utilizes an inertia system which uh, is based on an ordinary low pressure direct injection system. Uh, but the inertia is uh, acting as a hammer and can increase uh, the fuel pressure up to, I think, about 50 bars doing the injection more efficient in terms of becoming quicker and also having a better distribution, uh, smaller droplets. The last and most sophisticated fuel injection system um, is not readily found, uh, at least to my knowledge, in two-stroke engines. It's called the HPDI system. And this is a similar system found on four-stroke engines. It's operating in a, on a very high uh, pressure level, around 200 bars, I think. It can provide smaller fuel droplets and shorter durations, so it should be possible to go with uh, later uh, uh, start of injection time, SOE, uh, but the potential is so far not completely understood by me. 
This was a very long course. I'm sorry for that. I have too much to talk about, obviously. Thank you very much for paying attention. And don't hesitate to contact me on my email address at lennart.sander at boostbuster.com. Take care.